from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This marks the 16th year of the festival and the fifth year of the contest, which would not be possible without the hard work of all the festival uh, people who are working on it, as I mentioned, Lola and Brianna. And we really want to present this in a two-part series. First, we want to honor the winners of a book that shaped me, National Book Festival Summer Writing Contest, and then we will hear from the winners of Letters About Literature. It's the library's National Writing Contest. And in the middle of the program, we'll be joined by a special guest. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. Uh, a book that shaped me was launched by the Library of Congress in 2012 with DC Public Library and has since expanded throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. The contest asks rising fifth and sixth graders to reflect on a book that has shaped their lives, influencing the way they see themselves, their communities, or their world. And books certainly do that. Students entered by writing a one-page essay, which sometimes is hard. You know, you think writing a 10-page essay is hard. Trying to put all your thoughts in a, in a compact way is hard as well. Um, and then they submitted in person to a participating public library in Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia. So this is a big contest. Uh, over the years, nearly 800 essays have been submitted to the more than 350 public libraries that have signed up to administer this contest as a part of their summer reading programs. Uh, the essays are then judged by members of the American Association of School Librarians and later by a grand prize panel of judges. Tough job. And of course, one of the people who had that very tough job is Fred Bowen, who joins us now. He is a sports writer for the Washington Post Kids Post. We love the kids' posts at my house, too, Fred. And he's been one of the grand prize judges since the contest began. Uh, this year, a book that shaped me received nearly 300 entries. I love that. And today, we bring you 30 finalists and state winners and our three grand prize winners as well, who will then read their winning essays on the stage. I'm going to read the names of the finalists by state, and then Lola and Brianna will hand them their certificates and awards as they come to the stage. Okay, get ready now. From the District of Columbia through its DC public library locations. Now listen, like an, a name like Unyang, I get a lot of mispronunciation, so please forgive me if I don't get your name perfect. I, I apologize in advance. Atalia Berger from Southeast Library. Come on up. Noah Antonio Dooley, the Watha T. Daniel Shaw ne Neighborhood Library. Lila Easton, the Northeast Library. Mason Gray, Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. Mason was also 2015 DC winner, so Mason, welcome back, congratulations. And the district winner for 2016, Abigail Kelso from Chevy Chase Library. So we're gonna take a picture of all of you together. All right, well done, congratulations. All right, now we're gonna to go to Virginia. Come this way, come on. Watch your step, watch your step. Congrats. We're going to go to Virginia. Alexia DaCosta from Arlington Public Library, who was a 2015 Grand Prize winner. Welcome back, Alexia. Shelly Dimry from the Arlington Public Library. Malika Khan, the Prince William Public Library, Chin Park Regional Library. Victor Vallen, the Mary Riles Stiles Public Library. And the Virginia winner, Isla Rodriguez from the Richmond Public Library, Ginter Park Library. Congratulations to all of you winners. Congratulations. All right, thank you, Virginia winners. Congrats, come on through. Watch your step. All right, we're gonna move on to Delaware. Molly Ammerling from the Frankfurt Public Library of Sussex County Department of Libraries, come on up. Emily Carpenter of the Dover Public Library. Lucy Goodwin, Newcastle County Libraries. The Hawkinson Library. Lucy can't be here today. 
Lauren Woods, Newcastle County Libraries as well. Lauren also could not be with us. And the Delaware winner, Rachel Smookler from the Newcastle County Libraries, Brandywine 100 Library. Congratulations. Congratulations to you all. You came from Delaware. Awesome. Congrats. All right, now we have the finalists from Pennsylvania. How about that? Lindsay Baldwin from the Western Pocono Community Library. Brenna Pipkin from the Lidditz Public Library. Gabrielle Stosky from the Wissahickon Valley Public Library System. I hope that's right. Sebastian Weaver, Montgomery County Norristown Public Library. And the Pennsylvania winner is Michaela Fafasong. Fasufong, Fasupong, sorry. Citizens Library. Congratulations. All right, winners, congratulations to all of you. I want to go to the Maryland libraries now, the finalists from all Montgomery County Public Schools. Zoe Antonischek from the Poolsville Library. Thomas Preston Barry Mike from the Aspen Hill Library. Grace Harvey from the Bethesda Library. Swati Savugan from the Quince Orchard Library. And the Maryland winner this year is Julia Lucy Grummet from the Bethesda Library. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, now for the West Virginians, all of whom are from the Martinsburg Public Library of the Martinsburg Berkeley County Public Library System. Sierra Ann Debert. Christian Javier Morel. Declan Mungovan. Declan was also the 2015 winner. Nessun Mungovan, and yes, they're brothers, and they won the prior contest. Very smart Mungovans, um, love it. The West Virginia winner this year is Alexia Rall. Congratulations. Mungavin. It's Mungavin. I'm sorry. The Mungavins. I knew I was going to get them wrong. All right. Can we just give all our wonderful finalists and state winners a big round of applause? We mentioned there were hundreds of entries, hundreds of entries, and you all did such a wonderful job, and we just would appreciate you taking the time to write. Keep on reading. Keep on writing. It's just a wonderful thing to do. You know, I was talking about my kids. Uh, the boys, the two older boys, like math, and I just can't help them with that. I'm like, can you, if you want to write essays, then I can help you. That was my thing. So I'm hoping they'll come around to like writing as much as they love reading. Well, the state and grand prize winners were selected from 30 finalists by a panel of judges, as we mentioned, selected by the Library of Congress that included children's authors, educators, library staff. And as we introduced you earlier, Fred Bowen has written 21 sports-themed books for children. He has been involved since the start of a book that shaped me and is here today to introduce the 2016 Grand Prize winners. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Fred Bowen. Thank you, that's right. My name's Fred Bowen and yes, I have uh, written 21 sports books that combines sports fiction, sports history, and there's always a chapter of sports history at the back. 
And I also write a uh, weekly kids sports column for the Washington Post. But what I'm very proud that I've been doing for the last five years is I've been one of the judges in a book that shaped me. And one of the things, and that means you read quite a few essays, and one of the things I have noticed over the years, we are not only getting more essays, we are getting better essays. Uh, the kids do a wonderful job. In fact, I'm starting to get a little nervous because I think there's going to be a lot of competition out there with book writers. But um, I'd also, I don't do this all by myself. I'd like to see if anybody is out there. We have uh, my fellow judges, Maria Salvador. Is she out there? And Rachel Walker. There she is back there. Let's give them a hand. Also helping us this year was uh, Jason Reynolds, who's a wonderful, wonderful author, uh, who will actually be speaking here at 445. So if you can hang around, really stay. He's a wonderful author, and I would encourage everybody to see him speak. And I also would encourage everybody to read his excellent and very timely book, All American Boys. Now what we're going to do is we'll present the awards for the grand prize winners. I'm going to introduce the winners, then I'll, uh, they will read their essay, and then I'll ask them a few questions about their uh, essay. First, Michaela Fasupong of Citizens Library, who wrote on The Sneetches by the wonderful Dr. Seuss. Would you please come up? Michaela is the third place grand prize winner and the Pennsylvania State winner. So, step up to the microphone and read everybody your essay. As a small child, my mom read a story to me numerous times. I never knew that it would change me for the better. Now I read it to my younger siblings. The book that shaped me is The Sneetches by Dr. Seuss. It may be silly that a story written for small children is a book which has shaped me. However, the Sneetches teach people valuable lessons about equality and diversity that even adults may need to be reminded of once in a while. This story starts off with bird-like creatures. Some have stars upon their bellies and some don't. For some reason, the star-bellied Sneetches feel that they are superior to the plain belly sneetches. The star belly sneetches leave out the plain bellies from their fun and games. Even the children were not permitted to play games unless there was a star upon their stomach. Then, one day, a fix-it-up chappy comes along with an odd yet one-of-a-kind machine. For a small fee, the machine put a star on the stomach of a plain belly sneetch. Of course, the star bellies lined up thrilled. They all thought about how they had a chance to be special. When the star bellies found out about the plain belly sneetches and their stars, they were very unhappy. So that fix it up chappy made another odd yet one of a kind machine. This one took off their stars from their stomachs. So, of course, the star belly sneetches went through. They had to stay different so that they could remain superior. Both the plain belly sneetches and the star belly sneetches went round and round, in again, out again, until no one knew who was who. Finally, they came to realize that they were all equal regardless of their stars. That day, all the sneetches forgot about their stars and whether they had one or not upon ours. The Sneetches was published in 1961. This was during the Civil Rights Moment, Movement, which eventually ended in the segregation of blacks. Dr. Seuss also served in the United States Army during World War II, in which many Jews tragically lost their lives. It is safe to say that Dr. Seuss witnessed his fair share of racism, discrimination, and overall struggles for equality. I 
Believe Dr. Seuss used the stars in his story as a symbol of race, religion, gender, disability, and any other characteristic which may have made us different from one another. Those stars weren't so big. They weren't really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. Dr. Seuss wanted his readers, young and old, to realize that we are all equal, regardless of our stars. This story shaped me because I learned early to be kind to others, regardless of their stars. After all, our stars are what makes every one of us unique. Our stars most certainly should not divide, divide us apart. I learned from this book that we need to be kind to each other and accept each other's differences. If each of us could be a little kinder to one another and celebrate our differences, the world would be a much better place. Even just a simple smile or a wave hello could help make one person's day brighter. They might even pass it on. Step by step, our kind heartness and compassion can shape the world for the better. I'm thankful that my mom read this story to me as a young child. It has made me a better person and more aware of how I treat other people. I would like to thank Dr. Seuss for writing this story with such a valuable lesson. Has this story shaped you? Well, that was wonderful. Um, Dr. Seuss has written lots of books. Now, have you read other books? Is he one of your favorites? Um, yes. Oh, okay. Can you remember any of the favorites that, uh, of Dr. Seuss? Because I remember the one that I love, and that is Horton Hatches the Egg. Did you ever yeah. read that one? Mm -hmm. Right. I remember that, what was it Horton says? He says, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant, an elephant's faithful 100%. Now, uh, what other uh, Dr. Seuss books did, uh, did you enjoy? Do you remember? Um, green Eggs and Ham. Um, I think he has a newer book out. I oh, yeah, where, title, you, where but... You'll Go or st stuff like that. All right. Um, now, your mom reads to you, do you, or did you say you now read to one of your younger siblings? Um, my mom read that book to me as a child, and now I read it too. Oh, and you still remember it. Well, you gave a wonderful reading of the essay. That was just terrific. Thank you. You did great. Now, would Lu uh, Julia Lucy Grumet of Montgomery County Public Libraries, in fact, Bethesda Library, which I go to many times, who wrote about the uh, lightning thief by Rick R Riordan, please come up. <laughs> Take a deep breath. All right. <laughs> Wait, should I move it? Why don't we do this? Okay. A little bit of it. Maybe like that. Step right in. So first I would like to thank um, um, everybody who supported me and helped me to write this essay. To most people, The Lightning Thief is mainly about people fighting To most people, The Lightning Thief is mainly about people fighting monsters and going on magical quests. I'm not saying that's false, I'm just saying there's more to it. A year before I read The Lightning Thief, I was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyper Disorder, ADHD. The diagnosis made me feel lonely, like I was the only person in the world who had ADHD. It made me feel insecure. Then I read The Lightning Thief. When I first learned Percy, the main character had ADHD, I wanted to put the book down. I did not like the sound of the word of, of, I did not like the sound of that word in my head or the fact that I had it. Those, letter, the, those letters on the page bothered me. 
It seemed as if the letters were in caps lock just to catch my eye. I remember, the sh I remember staring at it for a minute and almost closing the book. Later in the book, when I figured out when I figured out another character, Annabeth, also had ADHD, I felt even more uncomfortable than before. I felt exposed and as if by reading the book, everybody would realize that I had ADHD. Eventually, I began to get used to it. Then seeing the word on the book made me want to keep reading it. Almost all of the amazing characters had ADHD, especially the demigods. The book taught me that ADHD could be a gift, not a punishment. The book was inspiring and, and it showed me all the great things about ADHD. The lightning thief made having ADHD sound awesome. It describes what it is and its advantages. For example, Annabeth talks about it saying, and the ADHD, you're impulsive. You can't sit still in a classroom. That's your battle reflexes. In a regular fight, they keep you alive. Percy, the main character, is impulsive but heroic, fidgety but quick. The other kids in my class who were reading the book wanted ADHD. After reading The Lightning Thief, I felt more confident about having ADHD. In school, I felt less embarrassed, and it helped me feel more similar to the other kids in my class. The, the, these, these really... Um, ugh. These relations helped me feel, helped me make more friends because I was no longer afraid that people would find out about my ADHD. I felt braver, which made it easier to raise my hand and par participate in class dis discussions. Annabelle, Annabeth is good at putting clues together to figure out a puzzle. For example, she realizes that a woman in glasses who makes sculptures is actually Medusa. In reading class, I'm aware of my created instincts and ability to see re relationships. Like Annabeth, this creative thinking leads me to pr predict plot twists and understand what motivates different characters. The Lightning Thief helped me realize the gifts of ADHD, including the quick reaction time which assists me with soccer and baseball since my reflexes are swift. ADHD also helps my reaction time in science class when I make connections. For example, when we, were when we were programming robots to to navigate a simple maze, I was able to use evidence from the previous robot challenge to, quick, to quickly calculate how to program my robot. This is similar to Annabeth. This is similar to when Annabeth was successful in playing a virtual city game in Los in the Lotus Casino. The Lightning Thief made it obvious that lots of people in the world have ADHD. I'm not alone. Having ADHD has a bright side. This book shaped me to become a more confident person and accept every part of myself. So, uh after you read the book, now do you tell your uh, friends that you have ADHD now that you've told all these people? It doesn't seem like it bothers you anymore. No, not really. I kind of got over it. Yeah, you kind of got it. It does seem like you got over it. Um, one thing I was wondering is the book is a fantasy book. Do you like fantasy books? Yeah. All right. Now, I don't. So explain to me. <laughs> explain to me why fantasy books are so cool. Kind of like ADHD, right? Okay. So, fantasy books, I find them more interesting, no offense, um, <laughs> because, like, you can have anything happen, like, um, a hippopotamus can ride on a unicorn and it's totally okay, but in nonfiction, that won't be true, therefore, I like fiction better. All right. Well, I can see that. In fact, I think you've convinced me... Thank you. You may have convinced me to go out and buy some fantasy books, all right? You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.
All right. Um, would Rachel Schmuckler, the from Newcastle County Libraries, and she wrote on Jack and Louisa, Act One, by Andrew Keenan Bolger and Kate Weatherhead. Please come up. How Jack and Louisa, Act One, shaped me. As the lights came up, I saw the blurred faces of the audience staring at me in the bright spotlight. As I exhaled, all of my nervousness whooshed out of me like a deflating balloon. When I inhaled, excitement took its place as I prepared to sing the first note of the opening song. This was the beginning of Act One. Last summer, I never could have imagined myself performing in front of hundreds of people. At my old school, my classmates labeled me as the shy girl who barely talks. My family was moving over the summer from Maryland to Delaware, and my main goal was to change that label at my new school. After the move, books were my best and only friends. Like a rabbit hiding from the world in its hole, I stayed in my room and shut out the world. Jack and Louisa, Act One, by Andrew Keenan Bolger and Kate Weatherhead, helped me out of my hole. It helped, when I started reading this book, all of my sadness and loneliness flew away like birds flying free in the wind. I was transported on stage, singing a song from Into the Woods with Jack and Louisa. In the book, Jack reluctantly moved from an exciting New York City life as a Broadway actor to a boring suburban life in Ohio. He missed all of the familiar activities in New York, such as picnicking in Central Park and eating ice cream on the Hudson River. After moving, I felt this he was also sad not to attend seventh grade at the Professional Performing Arts School. After moving, I felt the same way. I missed my favorite Maryland activities, such as eating mint chocolate chip ice cream at the Annapolis Ice Cream Company, enjoying the beach with friends, and devouring blue crabs at local seafood restaurants. Jack and Louisa, Act One, helped me to feel less alone since it was about another kid going through the same challenges as me. Reading the book also made me curious about Broadway. I started looking up songs from musicals and listening to them. Soon, I became what Louisa calls a musical theater nerd, someone who is obsessed with musical theater. I dusted off my mom's old Secret Garden CD. When I listened, I immediately fell in love with the mysterious ghostly songs. My parents got so tired of me playing the soundtrack nonstop that they begged me to turn it off, just like Jack and Louisa's parents did whenever they played Into the Woods. When winter arrived, the opportunity to change my label and explore my interest in musical theater came along. I mustered up every bit of courage I had and auditioned for my school's musical. By then, I had made many friends besides Jack and Louisa at my new school. I even encouraged some of my friends to audition with me. With the courage that Jack and Louisa gave me, I felt like I could do anything. When my turn to audition came, I, I felt all my nervousness disappear. That weekend, I was thrilled to find out I was cast as a narrator. I knew, that I, I, I knew that I had achieved my goal to change my label. I wasn't a shy girl who had lost her voice, but an actress whose voice would be heard throughout a large auditorium. My school's musical was a success, and before the curtain fell, I gave Jack and Louisa a bow in my imagination for helping me in so many ways. This book helped me to find and explore my new passion for musical theater and to learn that change can bring new adventures and exciting opportunities. It also gave me the courage to show the world my true self. Well, that was wonderful, uh, Rachel. Now, I don't know much about the book, and I don't mo know much about musical theater, but we do have two people in the audience who know a great deal about the book. 
uh, because the authors, Andrew Keenan Bolger and Kate Weatherhead are here, and uh, they uh, were thrilled about you winning the contest. So I think we should have them come up and ask the questions uh, of Rachel. Congratulations, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I know that this competition is called A Book That Shaped You, but honestly, as authors, you stare at a blank screen and you never can really know what the impact is going to be. And so getting to be here and seeing this, it really is the prize for us as well. It's really, really generous. Yeah, and congratulations to all of the winners today. This is such a, it's just a thrill for us to be here and to celebrate with you and the two other essays were just fantastic, so congrats. And uh, so we're supposed to ask you some questions, I guess. Um, what, what, what was the name of the show that you did, that you were the narrator for? Aladdin Jr. Awesome. Cool. Um, do you know that this guy was in Aladdin at one point? You did a production of yeah, Aladdin. Yeah, indeed. Awesome. And so, <laughs> okay, so tell us now, first of all, I'm so proud of you for facing your fears. That's such a big deal. Um, what is it now about performing that you like the best? I like singing. It's just like, I love music and I love singing with my mom and we both just love singing so it's really fun for me and for her too. So. Awesome. Now Jack and Louisa, it's a book about friendship I think mostly and especially about an outsider who meets that one friend who has a shared passion that really, it changes the game. Did you feel like uh, when you moved to your new place that there was that one friend who really changed your life? And if you want to give a shout out to them right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I, ha I met a lot of friends, but after I auditioned for the musical, um, I met a girl named Neve, and we just both really, really loved Broadway, and we liked singing it together, and it was just really great to have her. So. I have one last question, and that is, when are you going to come visit us in New York? <laughs> I, am I'm, I am in the process of trying to get my parents to let me see a show on Broadway for my birthday. So, Well, you need to hit us up, because chances are we can find some way to bring you backstage at that show. Yeah. <laughs> and parents... I feel like this would be a really nice reward for writing such a beautiful essay. Yeah, no pressure. Hint, but... hint, her birthday's coming up. <laughs> um, thank you so much, well, Rachel. Thank you. Congratulations. What just happened between Kate and Andrew and Rachel is why the National Book Festival is as wonderful as it is. Um, I, what a special moment. And when people say books change lives, it's not just something we say. Uh, these essays that were just written, read by these wonderful finalists, uh, just evidence of how they change lives and how they impact, I hope, every single one of us in the audience. Thank you so much for your beautiful writing and for sharing it with us. Can we give another round of applause? Thank you so much. What a wonderful surprise. Thank you for being here. It's so great. All right. So I believe we also have someone here from the Delaware Division of Libraries who traveled up here to also congratulate you. Is Patty Langley here? Is Patty here? Oh, thank you for coming. Can you stand up to be recognized? Thank you for coming. Thank you, Fred. And you have fans in my house. <laughs> I know they like fantasy. Okay. Um, we have a very special guest with us this afternoon. Carla Hayden is the new Librarian of Congress. And as today we celebrated the opening of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which was such a momentous occasion, um, here is a woman who's also making history. She is the first woman and the first African American to hold this position. 
Carla Hayden, please join us on the stage. And we also want to invite the grand prize winners and the state winners and all the finalists afterwards to join us for a group photo. But we um, want to also make sure that we capture this wonderful moment together. Do you want to have them come up? Do you want to come up right now? All the grand prize winners, the state winners, and the finalists, so we can take a picture. You have to get in the middle, yep. Come on in the front. Hold on. There you go. Okay. Come on, honey. You can squeeze your face right in there. You got everybody else? Okay, good. She's taking the official photo. Aren't you glad you stayed? Because now we're going to go to the second portion of our program, which celebrates the Letters About Literature Youth Writing Contest. And here to tell us more about this is Pam Jackson, the director of the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress. Pam. Good afternoon. So thank you, it's a pleasure to be here and to celebrate youth literacy in such a fun and exciting way. The Letters About Literature program is a reading and writing contest for students in grades four through 12. Students are asked to read a book, poem, or speech and to write to the author about how the book affected them and uh, personally. And letters are judged on state and national levels more than 50,000 students from across the country enter Letters About Literature each year. Teachers and librarians support the process and receive training and guidance to fulfill the intentions of the program. So as we begin to celebrate the winners of this year's contest, allow me to say more about our special guest, Carla Hayden, who was sworn in as the new Librarian of Congress just 10 days ago. What a way to begin her work, her, her tenure. So she's a former chi children's librarian and most recently an Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore as its CEO for more than two decades. And she brings with her a level of energy and excitement for reading and knowledge. And she has a particular passion for so many aspects of the work we do. So we're thrilled to have her with us today to honor all the youth participants in the writing contests and to share her thoughts about the importance of reading. Carla Hayden. Thank you. Congratulations to all of the winners and to everyone that entered the writing contest, a book that shaped me and letters about literature. I have to tell you, as I was listening to our winners talk about the books that shaped me, I thought about the book that did shape me. It was called Bright April. And I was seven years old, and I walked into a storefront library across from PS96 
in Jamaica, Queens. And I don't know who put this book in my hand, but somebody knew that a little brown girl with pigtails, who, and I don't think they knew I was a brownie, would love a book called Bright April because I saw myself in that book. And even to this day, whenever I see that book and I have a copy, I hug it and I smile because I knew if I could be see myself in a book, that was something I wanted to share with others. Now, more than a million students participated in the Library of Congress Letters About Literature contest, and we are especially grateful to the supporters Dollar General Literacy Foundation for their support two years in a row. Tonight and today, and this festival has been a whirlwind. We are celebrating people and young people who write about what books mean to them. And so we're gonna bring up the winners and hear from them. you going to do it? Yes. Oh, do you, do you, do you, do you? I think it was mentioned that I've only been sworn in for 10 um, days. I will, I will defer to However, I have used this opportunity to be new to say, can I do that? Yes. Can I do that? So I just happen to have the list of the winners, yes. and I'm going to take privilege. I might not be able to do this 100 days from now, but... <laughs> I'd like to be able, because I see your name was there, Mr. Oh, no, I want to. to announce the, na the national winners of Letters About Literature contest. First, Alima Kelly from Connecticut, <laughs> level one national winner for fourth through sixth grade, reading a portion of her letter to Alex Gino about the book, George. Hello. Um, almost everybody left. Okay. Um, dear Alex Gino, your book George has inspired me in many ways. It got me thinking about how life is not fair, especially to specific groups of people I hadn't really ever thought about before. People that are unable to really be themselves. It also inspired me to be true to myself not let anyone's expectations or judgments make me change who I am. Your book made me think more about how life can pose totally unexpected problems that are very hard to deal with. George was born in a boy's body, but he feels like he's really a girl. He worried about whether his own mom would still love and accept him for who he felt he really was if he told her. He couldn't be himself with friends and classmates, which caused him to limit him his friends to only one. People shouldn't have to be scared of what people think of them, especially their own family members. In your book, when George told his mom he felt like a girl, she couldn't accept it. Mothers are supposed to love you no matter what, even if you aren't what they hoped you would be. When I thought about that, I realized when George's mom didn't accept him, he sort of shut down and he became discouraged. After I read this book, I thought about how it's not a bad thing if a girl says that she's a tomboy and she can enjoy the outdoors, run, climb, and like sports, and the more traditional boy colors like blue and green. A tomboy is usually seen as a positive trait. On the other hand, if a boy says that he wants to do ballet, sewing, playing with dolls, or that he likes pink or purple, he'll risk being teased and not being accepted by others. I don't think that's fair and it doesn't make sense. If a boy wants to go and play dress up, they are limited as to what they can get dressed up as without being called names or being made fun of. They can wear a pirate costume or be a superhero, but if they want to wear a princess costume or something girly, they will be thought of something, of, they will be thought of something less than a boy. I even thought about how sometimes if a boy doesn't want to fight with someone and they want to resolve the issue with words, they will be thought of as a wimp because they don't want to fight? Boys are not supposed to cry or show emotion, but they are supposed to act tough. That seems so ridiculous because everyone has emotions and everyone should be able to feel and show all of their emotions. 
I also thought about how many people, like George, have to live their life scared of what people will think of them, forced to hold in this really big secret their whole life. I thought about how, much, how there was a whole issue about Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, having lived his whole life hiding a big secret for many decades because of what other people would think. Even though Bruce Jenner was famous, accomplished, rich, and admired by millions, he still had to struggle with what people would think of him for 60 years before he let out his big secret. If that was so hard for a world famous athlete, it made me realize how much harder it would be for a child like George to have such a huge secret in middle school that they couldn't share with anyone because even their parents might not understand or accept their feelings. After reading this book, I gave my friends a list of words and asked them to tell me if each word described boys or girls. The words like blue, green, sports, science, math, writing, computers, building, getting in trouble, scary, fighting, teasing, driving fast, inventing, and exploring were ones most people said described a boy. The words Barbie, dresses, hair, stylish, worried about appearance, quiet, giggling, using correct grammar, getting along, clubs, driving safely, fancy clothes, being helpful, pink, purple, and following rules were ones most of my friends chose as describing a girl. I thought that in a way, society brainwashes us as if everybody should fit into the boy and girl boxes that they created. I thought of how many people think that they will be judged because they don't fit in with society's expectations. Society tells us we want to need to be normal to fit in. I thought about parents and even my parents, how some were brought up to believe these things. Most of the kids that make fun of people who think, act, or look differently are doing what they have been taught by society and by their parents, who also believe in some of society's expectations. I believe that it is time that we change these expectations. We know now that a person's physical body does not determine who they are or who they like or what they like or how they feel. Ever since I read your book, I've been more confident in myself and I've been trying to put myself in other people's shoes before I speak. Your book helped me better understand how people would feel when they can't be themselves. I think your book helped me become a better person someone who will stand up for people who are being put down, and someone who will accept others as they want to be. I haven't found any other book that talks about this issue, of a teenager who feels like they don't belong in the body they were born with. It made me realize that not only should kids be reading your book, but so should adults and parents. Because even though change is scary, no one should have to feel afraid to be themselves. Thank you, Alex Gino. Your book led me to have many discussions with my librarian, my parents, and my friends. Your book and the issues it raised helped me be someone who is more supportive of people who face stereotypes like the ones in your book, about who people are, how they should act. Your book made me realize that maybe I can help the next George be accepted throughout their life, and I can also help the next mother of George better accept their child if they have that challenge. I want to make sure that the next Bruce Jenner can be Caitlyn from the beginning, when they first feel that way. I don't want anyone to have to live their whole life hiding the secret of not feeling the gender that the doctor told them that they were born with. Your book made me want to help others accept themselves and others without prejudice or any stereotypes. Finally, your book made me realize how lucky I am to be comfortable with myself and to feel like I belong in my own skin and to have parents and friends who support me just as I am. Thank you. Well, I really get to this is wonderful to get to ask you a question. So I wanted to be a, a shortstop and was told <laughs> that might not be such a good idea, not because I didn't have talent. Um, have you ever been told no, you can't do something? You can step up to the mic. Um, 
I think um, one time that I have been told I couldn't do something is I was um, trying to start a business of selling sweets and baking things. And um, I sold stuff at a festival that my dad like runs at Trinity College. And I sold stuff for like a year. And then when I told the people at my school and I started um, I asked the principal if I could do like a bake sale at our school. He said yes, but then uh, my teacher, she didn't want me to be selling things or doing things because she said that it wasn't appropriate for... Oh, appropriate. <laughs> yeah. I know that word. <laughs> for a kid to be selling things. I know. I've been told it's not appropriate. I had to look it up the first time. And what are you reading now? That's what I'm really interested in, too. I am reading a book called Empire of Storms by Sarah J. Maas. Yeah. What's it about? Um, it is like the seventh book in that series, so I can't tell you guys too much because it'll be a spoiler. Yeah, don't. Um, don't. So it is about a girl, and she is... Oh, I can't tell you guys that. Yeah. Um, but she, um, in the first book, she is in... Uh, like a slave camp called Endovier and they have to mine salt and then the prince um, calls her in to work for the king as an assassin Whoa. and so she has to try to get out of that yeah I think book. she should yeah. Yeah, yeah. well thank you so much and thank you for sharing So I said, oh, now you can announce the next one. And she said, oh, I, you can do it. I don't think it would be fair. See, that's not appropriate, but that's OK. So I've now for the national winner at level two for seventh through eighth grade, Rhea Kinney from Washington, DC, reading a portion of her letter to Maya Angelou about the poem, Old Folks Laugh. Okay. Hello. Dear Maya Angelou, old folks laugh. How true it is. I love to watch their cloudy eyes crinkle at the edges and lift just a little. I like to see the spirit come again to their face. I like to watch their drooping cheek lift toward the skies. When old folks laugh, they free the world, you wrote in your poem, Old Folks Laugh, and I couldn't lift my eyes from the page. Someone like you, who can take something that seems so big, but make it as big in words as it feels in my heart, becomes an inspiration to me. Every Thursday, I volunteer at a senior's home. For nearly two years, I have worked on the third floor with the people who have worsening cases of dementia and Alzheimer's. It's hard to watch sometimes as their memory seems to flow away like water. Oh, but how I love to see them laugh. It's as if they drank a tall glass of their memories and everything came back. Some days it's fine and they remember nearly everything, but other days it's, do I know you? Your poem seems so selfless. You describe the elders perfectly with the right touch of play. You sound as though you have watched carefully as their smile becomes a giggle and then a full-fledged laugh. You have really helped me notice the details. Last week at the seniors' home, I noticed how the seniors' pants are often a little too big and a little too baggy. I have noticed their yellowing teeth, their scratchy polyester sweaters, and their crooked feet as they struggle with their walkers. I have noticed the faded interior of their rooms and the pictures that memorialize their past scotch tape to their walls. Through the richness of your descriptions, I have noticed things such as how, how each elder has their own laugh. Jane, in her wheelchair, tends to lightly titter, while Rosemary, who likes to sew, tends to daintily snort. Robert likes a deep belly laugh where sometimes he can't catch his breath and you have to pat him on the back. You have made me realize just how much soul they have. I like to watch as the old folks laugh, mostly because it makes me happy, watching each person be reminded of the incredible parts of their life. I like to think I share with you the tendency to appreciate the small things. But then again, it isn't really a small thing when the elderly laugh. To you and I, it is like a bar of gold. 
The old folks generously forgive life for happening to them, you wrote. Though your poem describes old people laughing, I think the content is covering a deeper meaning. It made me realize the stories behind their smiles and the meaning behind their laughs. Robert might like to laugh as much as he does because once he was in the war, through the desperation, the great war, through the desperation, death, and horror, he and his friends needed a way to find happiness among the bleak days. Jane grew up in a proper society where laughing too hard was considered improper, and so she titters rather than actually laughing. Some days, it's like my elderly friends and I are riding on top of a wave on an oncoming laugh. Those are the best days. Since reading your poem, however, I have also noticed the ones who don't laugh. I've been quite shocked by that fact. I'll say something funny, or one or two might smile a little and one might giggle, but the rest won't even turn up their lip. I try to convince myself that they still feel well enough to laugh and they simply don't find me that funny, but I know in my heart of hearts they have forgotten how to laugh. I try to figure out a way to teach them again, for it's one of life's greatest pleasures. Because of this, in many ways, reading your poem has inspired me to be a better caretaker of the old and helps me see strength in their fragility. Knowing how delicate they are and how much life they have already lived and how many laughs they have already laughed and how many stories they have lived to tell makes me feel more appreciation for them. Your poem, though it describes how the elderly laugh, not only has opened my eyes on, to their thoughts and feelings, but it has also caused me to think about how they have lived and how their stories have affected them. I'm around these incredible people a lot, and I'm very grateful to spend time with them because I know they have a lot of wisdom to teach me, despite their failing memories. Thank you for writing Old Folks Laugh. You have helped me notice and appreciate the stories and small things, both with the elders and the simplicities of everyday life. Your poem relates to me so much that it makes me smile to know I'm not the only one to find pleasure in old folks. Thank you. I think we can all agree that Maya Angelou is smiling. When you are talking, and this lady is showing me how to be appropriate again. Okay. And as usual, I'm working on it. Uh, I, I'd love to know, do you ever hear them someone tell you a story while you're there or working with them? Yeah, they tell lots of stories. Some of them true and some of them not true. Oh, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you enjoy that hearing the, yeah, the ones. Yeah, a lot. Them. So does it make you want to write more? Yes. In written. different poetry or? I've written a lot of poems about old people and I should write a story. I think you might want to do that. Well, thank you for sharing your, your thoughts. And as I say, we thank you for Maya Angelou. Thank you. Well, I get to do another one. And for the national winner at level three for ninth through 12th grade, Sarah Laurie from Colorado, reading from her letter to Dorothy Parker about her book, Penelope. Dear Dorothy Parker, the other night I sat with my family around the dinner table, reminiscing and telling old stories. My grandma told one about the time when my mom was eight years old and wanted to play the flute. The story goes, my grandma went down to the music store to rent a flute, but the salesman told her she needed a man to sign the contract. Being a single mother, she asked her father to go to the music store and sign the papers verifying the $2.50 bill would indeed be paid each month. I was shocked that such a relatively short time ago, women were not trusted to make a small, simple payment. In my life, there are some pretty amazing people, but my grandma stands out as one of the most extraordinary. When my mom and her siblings were young, 
um, when they were young children, their dad left them, leaving the protection and care in the hands of my grandma. She managed to raise four kids, maintain a stable job, a house, and all that one needs to be happy. She was successful on her own with no male figure by her side. Not to say there weren't hard days, even hard years, but in the end, my grandma was still a hero and still is today. Even now, at 77 years old, she is the director of a lifelong learning institute for elders. She is, she is such an incredible and unique human being because of her ability to be a strong, empowered woman in the face of a hardship. When I read your poem, Penelope, not only did my grandma come to mind, but the potential and power of all women did. This extraordinary poem has altered my perception of the role of women figures in the traditional male hero stories and in my own life. As I grow older, it has become apparent that the world around me struggles with gender equality. Job opportunities, raises, wages, access, women fight harder and longer every day to achieve equality. That is why we need constant clear reminders and guidance to continue the shift away from how things have been and still are today. Your poem offers such guidance. As seen in Homer's poem, The Odyssey, Odysseus sets sails on a heroic eventful journey where, while Penelope tends the baby and deals with domestic affairs in Ithaca. Penelope's hope and determination remains constant throughout his absence, making Penelope the true hero, much like my grandma. A key to understanding your poem is the title itself. The Odyssey is titled after Odysseus, the male hero. By titling your poem Penelope, you push the readers to question the belief that only men are heroes. Although Odysseus led the long and eventful journey, his story could not exist without Penelope. She serves as, a rock, as the rock that holds the fort down, so when Odysseus returns, he has the people of Ithaca to deem him hero. While Penelope is an almost invisible character in the epic story, the entire journey could not exist without her steady presence. We have a concrete image in our minds of the roles and obligation the male and female figure hold. But why? It takes two to tango. In other words, Penelope's presence in Ithaca is essential to everyday life, yet is barely acknowledged in the story. I like how your poem concludes, they will call him brave, emphasizing the fact that the readers are led to view the story in the light of Odysseus's journey during which he becomes a hero. Penelope serves as proof that although heroic adventures seem to focus on male actions, both female and males contribute, contribute to the successful outcome. I experience gender inequality firsthand every day. Boys get called on twice as often as girls in the classroom, and when stating the answer, don't qualify it with I think or maybe. Even something as small as when the PE teacher yells girls against boys reflects enriched bias. As I went about my sophomore year, you brought to my attention that most clubs, teams, and even some classes are defined solely by gender. When I was young, I had the opportunity to join a boys soccer team because there weren't enough girls to complete our own. After reading your poem, I finally understood that the coach's open-mindedness gave me an opportunity to prove my strength and resilience. This allowed me to take a small first step into the woman empowerment movement alongside my grandma. Ever since I read your poem, Woman empowerment shows up everywhere I go, in places I previously looked over. The examples continue to pop in my head. My middle school principal, a pilot on the plane on a recent trip, high-profile TV role models like Ellen DeGeneres and Oprah, the girl who joined the wrestling team and wins matches. I could go on. My point is, you have made it possible for me to acknowledge amazing women right before my eyes, women who take an active role in the movement towards gender equality. I used to not think twice about occurrences such as these, but your poem has opened my eyes. And now I realize these, women's, these women are worth stopping to think about, yet are not often seen. And now, I truly appreciate strong, emp empowered women and want to become one myself. Since freshman year, I've been on a palms dance team at my high school. We perform soccer, we perform for football, soccer games, rallies, competitions, camps, and other sport events. We work extremely hard every day to get better and stronger, yet our team continues to be dimish, diminished. We don't receive the funding or status other teams enjoy. We are constantly brushed aside when it comes to athletic programming support. As may be, as may be predictable, we are an all-girls team. Cheering for the boys' athletic team isn't the problem, but not being treated as equals is. 
maybe the funded boys team see themselves as cutting the glittering waves while we brew the tea and snip the bread. Our participation is a key part of the high school sports equation and should be supported as such. We perform, train, and do everything required for the boys team, yet don't get nearly the wide range of support they do. Reading your poem gave me insight into my personal experience and made it clear to me that I need to stand up for my team and the amazing young woman on it. As a new freshman join us, I encourage them to view our team as powerful and equals to all the others. We are rising above the outdated approach and lack of support and empowering ourselves to fight for equality in the eyes of the school's athletic program. This is one POMS team, one school, one athletic program. We may only be a small piece to a larger puzzle, but every piece counts. The Boulder Valley School District alone has 56 schools. Within these 56 schools, the fight for equal treatment within the athletic department must be a priority. Female sports must be treated with the same support as male sports, an effort to set a precedent for the bigger picture. The one-sidedness and lack of equality in the educational system full of young women at such an essential time in life is the last thing our schools need to promote and will lead to more drastic gender inequality issues. If school districts can maintain gender equality in something as simple as a sport, a sport, it will start a ripple effect, eventually allowing the young adults within the school to carry gender equality into everyday adult lives. Your poem has inspired me to look more deeply into feminist ideas. Maya Angelou once said how important it is for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and sheroes. My point is, Maya Angelou, you, and now myself are taking the steps to extinguish the weak female stereotype and instead encourage woman empowerment. We can live in a world where all genders live as equals. You have helped me recognize that beginning with old Greek mythology to present day, gender bias has existed. Yet there is no real reason for the bias to exist other than the fact that society has not had the critical mass to drive the change. That is why I will continue to work to break down the wall that allows gender stereotypes to impact schools and sports. Thank you, Dorothy Parker, for opening my eyes to the ability to enlighten others to the concept and reality of women empowerment that will shape our world to gender equality. Sincerely, Sarah Lurie. So I'm just imagining Dorothy Parker and Maya Angelou looking down saying, wow, <laughs> what a duo. You mentioned that it's inspired you to uh, read more about feminist ideas or women's studies. Mm -hmm. What, anything kind of really interesting? Um, I'm trying to think. Well, I know, I mean, I read um, a lot of like Maya Angelou and stuff about oh, her feminist did. ideas, yeah. But recently at the school, we're um, trying to um, get more funding and do the things necessary to like be treated as equal. So there's a lot of work on that and research on that too. <laughs> and I think that's an area that we can all agree that we'll help with. And I'm so glad you mentioned the funding. Because mm -hmm. it really, how do you feel when you really just say, look at the differences? Yeah. It's just like really discouraging because as a team, like we spend hours and hours every day and like every year and it's a year round sport and to like not get the same amount of respect and funding as some teams that are even just seasonal sports, I think is just, it's discouraging, but we have each other to support one another and we're gonna try to break out of that, that pattern. And one pattern I'm going to get out of after hearing you is to not say I think so much. <laughs> so thank you so yes. much. <laughs> right, right. Yes, I was going to invite Alima and Raya back up for a group photo. I'd also like to have Kathy Gurley, our program director for the Letters About Literature program, join us for the group photo. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.